Thank you, um, everybody, for, for being here. Um, it's always great to, to have the chance to, to talk a little bit, and it gives me a chance to sort of uh, explore some of the things that I'm, I'm uh, trying to present, both in the book and in the, the counterpoint um, document. And I'm going to repeat one of the messages that Edward just mentioned now, um, and it's in the title of the book, and that, that is that history and culture really matter. And they really matter in terms of understanding what is going on anywhere. And that is no less true in the Somali Horn of Africa than it is here or anywhere else. So I'm going to try and make that point uh, rather clearly. So I'll, uh, I'll do so in a number of different ways. But I don't want to start there. What I want to start with is a point that I, I, I always think it's necessary to sort of make a statement about why, why I wrote this, why I, why I feel as though I have some right to write, write this. Um, and that's that, as someone who's clearly not a Somali, I nevertheless think that I'm able to bring a perspective, an outsider's perspective, an academic's perspective, that I think should have some value. Now, of course, it has its limitations as well. I'm not a policy maker, so I'm not going to go away tomorrow and change Diffitt's policy on whatever it is about Somali you know, development. Um, what I can do, though, is, is take a position that is somewhat, that strives to be somewhat objective, and it strives to be because I'll never be objective. No one can be objective, but I, that's one of the objectives. Um, and, but with it comes some, some responsibility, and the responsibility is to take as much care as I can about what I'm presenting. And part of that message is exactly the issue of history and culture, to try to understand what is going on and to place it in a context which gives it some meaning and some, some heft, some, some weight, and gives some explanatory power in terms of what's going on. Now, I want to start off this, this talk with apologies to Saeed Samatar, um, because I'm going to take something he said in one of his books in, that he published in 2003, and I'm going to disagree with it. And the thing that he said was that Somalis are a society addicted to congenital egalitarian anarchy. And I want to take issue with that. And I want to take issue with that, but at the same time, I want to present that as one of a number of polarities that I'm going to talk about, dichotomies. Um, so for some people, for critics, for people looking from the outside and from the inside, the Somali horn is an area of chaos, an area of anarchy, an area where it, states just don't happen in spite of the best efforts of everyone involved. That I don't believe is true, and I believe that history tells us that that isn't true. But the other side of that is an equally damaging um, opinion, which is really for the romanticizers who laud Somaliland as an indigenous political settlement that has somehow achieved democracy in spite of the odds, in spite of that congenital tendency to anarchy. And that too is not correct. And I want to, I want to present those two extremes and suggest that there is a, a line down the middle which actually results in some quite different policy formulations from some of the ones we've seen. My case is that, my case is altogether more prosaic than either of those two positions, but I believe it is really important that we get some of the nuance that, uh, that lies behind that mundanity. There are some key misunderstandings there. One of the misunderstandings I'm going to talk about is the use of the word democratization to describe the process of elections that Somaliland's been experiencing. It's not democratization, and I'll explain why in a moment. I want to address those things by placing them, as Edward said, in a historical and cult cultural context. Now, of course, I'm not going to be able to do history and culture of Somali uh, society in, in the 20 minutes I've got now. I'm not going to pretend to. I can't even do it in the 390-odd pages in here, but I do make an effort to do some of it. Um, but I want, to give, I want to touch on a few things. And I want to make the point that politics is, of course, rooted in local history and culture. And what I'm talking about is politics. Small p politics, but politics nonetheless. Socio-political socio politics, but politics nevertheless. Now, politics is deeply in, r embedded in culture. It's deeply embedded in local sit situations. But politics and culture are not the same. And actually, we've had some interesting, I've had some interesting discussions as a result of some of the talks that I've given around the book and around this subject about how interlinked they are and some of the pressures that each applies on the other and the influences. 
So they are very closely interlink interlinked, but they are not the same. And that leads us to another polarity, an interesting one. A polarity that presents Somaliland as either a betrayal of Somali unity, and that's a, a narrative that feeds into or draws on the idea of Somali Wayne, which means big Somali, that the idea that because there's one unity, one cultural homogeneity of you know, Somalis, a linguistic commonality and so on, the homogeneity is not true, but even as far as it is true, the suggestion that because there's that homogeneity, there should be a political homogeneity, cultural e equals politics, that is problematic and has caused pr great problems in the past, the conflation of the two. But the second is this idea that Somaliland is the little country that, that did, that all that needed to happen was Somalilanders need to be let, let go, let do it themselves. That gives rise to an idea of Somaliland as an exceptional um, instance, e Somaliland's exceptionalism. Um, against all the global odds, the odds of non-recognition, the odds of non-integration with the international system, the odds that are no international aid, these are fallacies. Those things are not true. There are elements of them that are true, and we need to draw out the elements, but the reality is not that Somaliland is somehow so exceptional that it can never be repeated anywhere else. That is not to say that Somaliland hasn't achieved amazing things. That's a very different statement. What is truly remarkable about Somaliland, and as I said, there are truly remarkable things, is not therefore that Somaliland was the place to introduce democracy to Somali society. Somali society is notably and deeply and fundamentally democratic. It's not that it's the only stable Somali area. There are other Somali areas that are not riven by conflict, and there have been throughout history. Somaliland is not the exception in that regard. It might be the exception at specific moments in time if we look at specific bits of the Somali horn, but not if we look more widely. It is not also remarkable because it is the first Somali state. Somaliland is not the first Somali state. History tells us that. There have been a number of long-lived, very successful, relatively centralized Somali states over the last thousand years. Not a huge number, but that number is si still significant. And they have been long-lasting. One that was based in the broad area of Somaliland between Hara, uh, just outside of Hara and, and Zela, was very successful over several centuries and was successful, so successful, that they were only finally defeated and driven back when they reached the shores of Lake Tana in Ethiopia by Ethiopian um, troops with the support of the Portuguese forming a, an overtly Christian army against an overtly Muslim army. So that, and that was, that was some hundred years ago, some few hundred years ago. So the Ajaran, the, the Adol uh, Sultanate, Sultanate was very successful as a government, as a state, functioning and for many of its years peaceful as well. Uh, so it is not that Somaliland is the first Somali state. There are other examples in the south as well. It is also not that it is a solely disconnected local solution. Um, what is remarkable about Somaliland is that it is the first bit of the Somali horn to come as far as it has in negotiating a bordered nation state that is Somali. Now, the words are critical. Bordered nation state, not state, but the introduction of borders in the context of a nation state, that's the innovation. And it is an innovation. Because Somalia didn't enjoy before 1960 any control over its affairs, any significant control at all, not during the colonial period. Prior to that, it was a series of city-states. It was fluctuating, changing um, tribal administrations and so on. Um, so through the colonial period, you couldn't call any Somali state a Somali, a Somali na nation state. After 1960, it only took nine years for the whole democratic experiment to unravel, to the point when Sir Barik's coup was mounted. Everyone was happy for it to take place. They were so sick of the corruption of, of democracy as it was practiced at that point. And since uh, post-1960, 1969, Sir Barik was forced to revert to increasingly autocratic measures to try and keep together this nation state that didn't really function. So there was no point in that period when you could say there was ever a consolidation of a Somali nation state per se. What Somaliland has done therefore in achieving that to the degree they have is remarkable. It's not finished, 
and there are key issues still to be resolved. But it is nevertheless remarkable. Now the critical point about borders and nation states is of course that they are all about who is in and who is out. They're all about things like citizenship. Who is a Somali lander? And a Somali lander didn't really have as much meaning until this idea of the nation state started to become a reality. It's also about compromise between actors, between aspirations. And there's a paradox there, of course, because for a lot of people, compromise is bad, almost, ex almost inherently bad. But in fact, in politics, compromise is necessary. And the reality, therefore, is that politics is never pretty. Politics is a messy, ugly game. Also messy and ugly is a process that Somaliland has had to negotiate in the process, uh, in, the, in the task of establishing this bordered nation state. And that is the transition from one form of democracy to another. Not democratization, but a transition from a discursive system of democracy where adult males at least all have a right to have a say in the process of making decisions on key issues. To a system where those adult males have to give up quite a lot of that power in favour of electing people who will then go and make decisions for them and will not return to them necessarily for five years or ten years until the next election. That is a diminishment of democracy for the men that are involved in that, that <coughs> equation. For women, a little less so, but it has actually compromised women's political power as well. So to call that a process of democratization is simply wrong. And it leads to problematic policy um, positions. Somaliland has tackled that process remarkably effectively. It's tackled it though in a way that is messy and is chaos driven and is also slow. It's chaos driven, it's crisis driven I mean, because still at the root of it is a process of consensus building. There is still a process of consensus building that has been melded into the pragmatic process of running elections and voting. And consensus driven politics will inevitably be crisis driven because it takes a crisis to bring everyone together and focus minds to the point where people are able to m reach the decisions on the critical issues that need to be reached. It's slow for the same reason. If everyone is going to be involved in that process, then it's going to take a lot of time. Those are also the reasons why consensus-based politics are not very effective in that bordered nation state. The bordered nation state needs representatives. So you need some kind of combination of those two systems. What Somaliland has done, and what is also remarkable, is it has shown, okay, all this mess, all this unprettiness, all the politicking, all the nastiness of, of making compromises, coming to agreements in situations where everyone feels as though they've somehow been done out of something. But it has also shown how it is possible to pull back from the point where that messiness becomes violence. And they've done that repeatedly since 1997. And that also is a really remarkable achievement. The pullback itself is often very difficult. It's often very messy. It looks like chaos. But I would argue it's not chaos. It's not chaos because actually it's a, deci it's a, it's a decisive uh, move on the part of the people that are involved. It's deliberate. Now, and I would, I would apply a term to that which is trendy at the moment, which is hybridity. But it's hybridity in a sense that is not formalistic. It's not a hybrid state in the formalistic sense. It's a hybrid state in the sense that that um, competition between competing interests and that willingness to pull back from the brink at the last minute and sometimes after what looks like the last minute, that's the hybridity because it brings together elements of consensus and elements of representation. Now, one of the things that interests me in this is, I said at the beginning, I'm writing as an outsider, I'm talking as an outsider, I'm talking as an academic, and I'm interested in the roles that outsiders can play in different situations. And one of the things, like a lot of words, the word outsider means different things in different circumstances. As soon as you start to look at it, it starts to become a lot less black and white than it looks at the beginning. Who is an outsider depends on the issue that you're talking about at the time. And it's interesting looking at that in the Somali context. Sometimes outsiders are, for example, clans that are not involved in a conflict, mediating in that conflict. 
Sometimes outsiders are women who are from neither the clan of birth of their father nor the clan of their husband and are therefore able to talk to both or from both clans if you want to look at it that way. Sometimes outsiders are diaspora. The last time I did a, a presentation on this last week, um, we had an interesting discussion about whether or not diaspora were outsiders. And the discussion started off with a member of the diaspora saying, we're not outsiders, we're fully inside. It ended with him saying, agreeing with another Somali who said, no, outside, diaspora always outsiders. You guys come in, you expect to, you know how things are done and you just do them the way you do them and you'll resent it. It's, a, it's an interesting discussion because actually they're both. Diaspora are both insiders and outsiders. And each of these figures, each of these, um, these, these groups are. Sometimes we're talking about religious figures. People who go away to or come from Sudan, Saudi Arabia, wherever it is, and come back with new ideas, new religious ideas, new ideas about how society should be organized, new ideas about how the law should work, new ideas about whether elections are good or bad, or whatever it happens to be. So there are outside influences on lots of levels there. Um, sometimes, too, outsiders are the people that we think of often first when we say outsiders. That is, diplomats, col colonists in the past administrators, donors, whatever it happens to be, academics. Now, sometimes, of course, those people have a good influence. Sometimes they don't have a good influence. Sometimes that influence complicates things. Sometimes it simplifies things. There are things that we can all bring. But it isn't appropriate, I think, to so simply talk about Somaliland having done it without any outside intervention. Not especially if you think of diaspora. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the international diplomatic development communities because they get a lot of flack for, for their perceived role in perpetuating state failure in the South and promoting policies which are perceived to undermine Somaliland's existence in the present. Um, some of that criticism is deserved, but a lot of it is not. I've already criticized the use of the word democratization, and I think there are insidious um, effects from the continued use of that word to describe the process of political support that donors contribute to the evolution and, and, and um, consolidation of uh, political processes and events such as elections and so on. It is not a process of democratization and to misrepresent or misunderstand it as such is to fail to recognize the reasons why some of the problems that occur before and during elections and after elections occur. So, for example, it's much easier if you don't think of this as a process of democratization, but understand it in the terms I was describing before as a diminishment for many men, many men adult males at least, and many women as well, as a diminishment of their, their democratic say in, in the consensus building. If you recognize that, then you can understand why voting is so difficult and why voting, why before an election happens, you have to have so much consensus building about who's which candidate standing for which party, what each party stands for in itself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those, those arguments and those processes make a lot more sense if you recognize that as not a, a system of a process of democratization. Um, so, I want <coughs> so I want to make the point there that there are, there are roles for outsiders, but there are, it's also important for those outsiders of their in, dif in the different forms they take to understand fully the processes that they're working with. Um, Somaliland's transition, as I've already said, is not one of autopoetic development. Outsiders are integral, outsiders of those different types. I mean, honestly, if external intervention wasn't important, then there wouldn't be so much passion in the argument for Somaliland recognition, would there? Also, it's important to remember that Somalis are business people, <coughs> traders, and have been for a thousand years. The links, trading links within a globalized world, and I mean a globalized world that's lasted a lot longer than the one we think of sometimes when we talk about globalization. I'm talking about that thousand years. Those links are deep and wide. They extend a long, long way back, and they are the reason that, for example, Somali, sta Somali staple food types several of the key food types are not even grown or produced in the country. They're staple because they are the result of trading. Why do Somalis eat so much pasta and rice? Drink so much tea? Is it because it's grown there? No, of course it's not. The meat is. 
and the meat's very good too. Somalis are business people then, traders. Islam too, I've just mentioned. Whoops, sorry about that. That was my timer telling me I've just done 20 minutes, but I'm going to keep going for a couple more. Um, Islam too, I, I mentioned, brings international con connections. And Somaliland does show us a lot about the roles that outsiders can play and the times that they are most and least successful or most or least likely, likely to be successful. Somalia too shows us, tells us many lessons in that re regard. Um, I talk in the book about a number of different instances in which international um, or outside intervention in one form or another has either worked or not worked. There was a particularly notable event in 2009 when the voter registration was, was reaching a, point, a crisis point, when it was looking as though things were going to move beyond crisis into conflict, when uh, um, very careful and painstaking intervention from outside resulted in a resolution of that crisis. So it's very important to recognize that there are instances where it can work. Um, at the Hargeisa Book Fair, when I was talking about this topic, um, one of the people in the audience expressed concern that that intervention showed that Somalilanders had lost the ability to negotiate the transition and political system that they were going through. I don't take that view. I wouldn't be nearly as pessimistic as that. I think sometimes there is a role for people to step in, in quite unusual ways, to try and find resolutions that are difficult. Um, given the normal run of politics. What I want to do is con conclude by saying, if the Somali horn is going to be stable in the future, I mean stability throughout the horn, then Somaliland has to be seen as a part of the solution. Now, I said at the beginning, I'm not a policy maker, I'm an academic, and therefore I have the privilege of being able to say, we need to find a way of making Somaliland a part of the, part of the solution without offering a solution in itself because I don't exactly know how that needs to work. But it needs to, be, it needs to be a positive part of that process. Somalilanders have long argued that recognition is way overdue. It's not as simple as that. It's not as simple as that because Somaliland doesn't have a sponsor in the form of a government in Mogadishu who's willing to grant recognition, or an international sponsor, the US, the UK, France, whoever, who's willing to take a unilateral action, or South Africa. Um, it's therefore a lot more complicated than simply a black and white decision, yes, no, we're going to recognize you, we're not. Unless Somaliland is able to find a trigger that creates that kind of sense of self-interest on the part of a country somewhere, it's not going to happen. What can happen, though, is, mo much more, um, is a much more iterative process of recognition, de facto recognition by default. In extended, continued um, ties, building ties that in, in all sectors that gradually create a situation which is effectively the same thing. At the moment, a lot of commentators are rejoicing in the death of Godani and the Amazon advances in the south of Somalia. And there's a tendency once again for attention to be diverted to the south away from Somaliland to a Somalia, where we think maybe, maybe we're starting to get things right. The current argument, or the recent argument between the Prime Minister and the President about whatever it was, the judiciary or, or just the role of, of, of the, the Prime Minister versus the President and being able to select their, uh, their cabinet ministers and so on, um, is maybe undermining that a little bit. But there's still, there's still a kind of hope that somehow there's been a a corner turned in the south. But mili the military conquest cannot be the only answer. And there is still a sense that if that military presence, if that Amazon presence wasn't there, then we would be back at square one. That's another reason why I'm saying that Somaliland needs to be a part of the answer because we need to be able to learn from what has happened there because what has happened there, for the reasons I've just said, is remarkable. Nevertheless, there are still a number of things that need to be resolved. Tensions in the east of Somaliland are still a big problem. And it looks as though things like the possibility of oil in that area, the Nugal Valley in particular, seems to be heightening the risk of, of renewed conflict in that area. Um, there's a competition between three political units which needs to be resolved somehow. Somaliland on one side, Puntland on the other side, Hatuma on the other, in the middle. Um, 
There is a lot of dissatisfaction with Somaliland amongst some people in the east of the country in particular. And that cannot be taken lightly. It doesn't, I, I'm, by saying that I'm not offering an answer, I don't know exactly what the answer is. But I can say that it's important that it is addressed in some way. So I want to conclude by saying it's very important in the Somaliland context, in the Somali Horn of Africa, that we understand the situation, we understand the context of what is happening, and that we understand some of the history and the culture that tells us a little bit about what that, what that process is about. If we, if we understand that, then I think it is possible to start building on what works. One of the points that I've made in the Counterpoint publication is that the Amazon advances in the South provide an opportunity to go back to something which I think we, we, we abandoned at our, at our cost, which is the chance to build local peace in areas in the South in a way that has happened in Somaliland. And that's one of the lessons that I think is important from the, the Somaliland process. So I'll, I'll end there.